have your Bible with you this morning, be turning to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. A very short letter right before the book of Hebrews. And while you're turning there, um, let me add one more prayer request. Miss Betty, you're not the only one that forgets from time to time. Uh, Calvary Baptist Church in Russell has uh, a mission team of about 31 folks headed to uh, Guatemala. They left very early this morning. And uh, Brother Chris Green that comes and fills in here from time to time is, is one of the uh, folks on that mission trip. And he has uh, re requested our prayers for uh, good travels and, and a good time of sharing the gospel and uh, safe, safe return home. Um, has, has any of you... Uh, heard the phrase, asking for a friend. We, we all do that kind of uh, from time to time. When we want to know something for ourselves, but we say we're asking for a friend, right? Well, in this uh, letter to Philemon, that's exactly what Paul's doing. He's asking for a friend. He's asking something on behalf of his friend Onesimus. Um, Onesimus was uh, a fugitive slave that belonged to Philemon. Onesimus uh, had allegedly uh, robbed Philemon of a pretty large sum of, of money in that day, and uh, he had left uh, the area that they lived in, Colossae, uh, which is where we know modern-day Turkey to be, kind of centrally located in, in modern-day Turkey. And he left there, and he fled and found his way all the way over to Rome, which is, is in Italy, in uh, a very large city where he could kind of just get lost in the crowd. He could hide, and nobody would recognize him. But y'all remember who was in Rome at that time, don't you? Paul. And through a uh, chain of events, Onesimus and, and, and Paul uh, run up on each other. Uh, and and uh, Onesimus is led to the Lord by Paul, and he is saved. And so uh, he begins to serve alongside Paul there for a short time. Some scholars would suggest that uh, Paul had led Onesimus to the Lord when he was ministering in Colossae. Um, and that when Onesimus ran away that he sought out Paul. But uh, it, it seems to indicate in the text that uh, Onesimus became a Christian after robbing Philemon and fleeing away, running away, and essentially bumping into Paul there in Rome. Uh, it says in Philemon, uh, there's only one chapter, so it's verse 10, uh, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son, or whom I begotten in my chains, or while I was in prison. And so Paul uses... Uh, that language to, to indicate that he led Onesimus to the Lord. Um, so we're going to take a look at a few of these verses today, beginning in verse 4. The uh, first three verses are just Paul's greetings to Philemon, and uh, most uh, people would agree that the people, uh, scholars would agree that the people listed there in verse 2 would be Philemon's wife and Philemon's son. Uh, in fact, um, uh, it is believed that Philemon's son, Archippus, uh, it says our fellow soldier was also a, a preacher or minister of the gospel. Uh, and it's likely that he had some authority there uh, at the church in Colossae. Coincidentally, that church in Colossae met in Philemon's home. Uh, this letter uh, to Philemon and his uh, family was delivered at the same time that the letter we know as Colossians was delivered. In fact, the same people are listed in the greeting there. Uh, the same people are listed as the ones who are to be received as bringing this letter. Onesimus is listed in the letter to Colossians as, as being one who is faithful. And so as we read about uh, uh, Paul's request for Philemon to uh, receive Onesimus, the runaway slave. And we kind of kind of have a different understanding of what that meant in those days versus what it used to mean to us today. Uh, a slave was just uh, someone who was uh, indebted 
A slave could have been someone who uh, was working to pay off a debt. A slave could have been someone who literally was, as we think about slaves, was outright bought and sold as a piece of property. Um, just depending on uh, their, their status in life, their class, if you want to call it that. Um, even the, the geography where they came from. A lot of folks uh, were, were very poor in those days and, and considerably poor in the Roman Empire. Uh, if you weren't a Roman or uh, on the uh, official payroll of the Roman government, there wasn't a whole lot of jobs to be done other than uh, agricultural or um, you know, the, the keeping up of, of small establishments. And so um, no doubt that Onesimus was probably uh, very poor and he had indebted himself to Philemon, uh, hence the temptation to take the money and run. And so, uh, as we begin reading in verse 4, Paul says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. And so, uh, there again, he's writing specifically to Philemon, Philemon's wife and Philemon's son. And then, in effect, uh, He's also addressing the, the church because this letter would have been read aloud um, because of Paul's uh, request that we're going to see a little bit later on. So Paul's letting them know that he's praying for them always, for their family and for the church that meets in their home. In verse 5, he says, Hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective in the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed or comforted by you, brother. And so he goes on and, and he just cuts right to the chase. This is the purpose for the letter uh, right here, verses 8 through 22. And he just, uh, again, a greeting and an, and an address uh, and, and a comfort of, of letting them know that he's praying for them. And then in verse 8, he kind of gets right down to it. He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting or what is proper. Yet for the sake of love, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart. And so there, he's just simply saying, receive him as you would receive me myself, if I were to show up. And then verse 13, he says, Whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So basically he's saying that he would like for Onesimus to have stayed with him and taken the place of Philemon. Philemon was, was um, you know, the one who had the church in his home, and he was doing great work and ministry around Colossae. And, and, and so Paul's kind of indicating to, to Philemon that Onesimus is doing those same things there in Rome as he ministers to Paul and with Paul on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 14, picking back up, he says, But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be a compulsion, as it were, but rather voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, and how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner or, or one who has fellowship with me, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me, even your own self, besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord and refresh my heart in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, prepare 
a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. So Paul is re requesting a couple of things here that Onesimus be received back, not only uh, to the, the family of Philemon as, as a part of that family, but also as a brother in fellowship of the church. And, and, and not only that, he says, go ahead and make a, a, a spot for me because when I get out of this prison, I'm coming to visit. And so it was kind of a kind of a request with a promise attached to it. And we know that Paul didn't make it out of there uh, through the reading of the other letters, but, but to kind of give an idea of what Onesimus meant to Paul versus what he had previously meant to Philemon, the name Onesimus means helpful or useful or profitable. And you see there in verse 11, he says, Formerly, he was useless to you as a slave who had robbed him and left and ran away. He was not profitable at all. He was useless. He wasn't there to, to participate in any work. He wasn't there to be depended on. He had taken money that, that could have been used for other things. And so Paul says that now Onesimus is, is not only profitable, but he is useful to me and to you. And that's why I'm sending him back. He's profitable to, to me because while they're in prison and their time of fellowship together, he encouraged Paul. He ministered alongside Paul. And now he could go back to Colossae. He could fulfill his duties as, as, as a slave or as a worker of Philemon and still spread the gospel and share his testimony and, and, and to do the things that he was doing there in Rome with Paul. And so Onesimus began to live up to his name as a believer in Christ. Now one other thing that we need to understand about this time and, and the things that were going on in, in, in the Roman world, it's estimated that there were about 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. That's way more than the population of the, of the Roman Empire. Those who were actually official Roman citizens or had bought their citizenship to become citizens of Rome, uh, they were far outnumbered by those who were considered to be slaves or uh, you know, debt workers, employees, that kind of thing. And, and there was always a fear that these 60 million some people would, would somehow rise up and go against and overthrow those um, who they, they worked for, or who they were quote-unquote owned by, and it was a constant threat in the Roman Empire. That was the one thing that, that, that they tried to keep squashed down as, as a government. And so whenever a slave would show signs of rebellion or, or insubordination or they would reject the authority that they were under, particularly running away, committing a crime, things like that, the punishment was very severe. They were dealt with in a very public way so as to send a message, hey, this is what happens to people like you. And it was always a message of fear. In fact, usually the punishment was being put to death. <coughs> Publicly put to death. The least thing that would happen and, and we can all relate to this, given um, the culture that we live in, is they would take a brand, just like we do cattle. They would take a brand, and they would heat that up, and they would put an F right in the middle of their forehead. Fugitive. And they would have that brand on their head, that scar right in the middle of their forehead for the rest of their life, because of the one time that they tried to escape, or the one time that they tried to enjoy freedom, or the one time that they tried to gain independence. They were labeled as a fugitive. And they were always looked down upon. They were always second class, last in line, the worst of the worst, because of those decisions that they had made. It was the mark of a runaway slave. A slave had no rights. They had no rights of ownership, no rights of any kind. There was no one a slave could appeal to. 
the, the judicial system wasn't on their side. If you were beaten, if you were robbed or whatever, you couldn't appeal to anybody. If you were mistreated, mishandled, um, even misinterpreted, you had nobody on your side. There was no authority to protect you. Everything was for the other side. Your master had the sole and complete authority over your existence as a slave. He had the right to terminate that any time he desired. He could kill them, he could sell them, or he could send them away. Anytime he wanted to. Slaves were often mistreated by being beaten. They were kept in the most miserable of conditions. Tradition. Philemon if he had desired, could have put Onesimus to death. It was permissible. He could have branded him with that F had he desired to, according to the customs. But Paul's saying, I want you to receive him. Greet him when he comes back as if you were greeting me. Shake hands. Give him a hug. Welcome him into your home, into your fellowship, of believers, because he's a believer now too. In verse 8 and 9 there uh, of, of what we just read, he says, I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is right. Paul, Paul says, I have the authority to tell you when he comes back and hands you this letter, take him in as if it is me myself coming into your home, coming back into your fellowship of, of believers. But he says in verse 9, rather on the basis of love, for love's sake, for the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the age. He says, I'm, I'm an old man, but now I'm also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so he's identifying himself as being an equal with Onesimus. I'm a slave for Jesus just like he was a slave for you. But now we're equal because he has accepted Christ as his Savior. And I want you to receive him as such. Receive him as if it's me, myself. I'm not demanding that you do this, but rather I'm asking that you do this. Because I know that the love of Christ resides in you as well. And so that's, that's the whole basis of this short letter to Philemon. And the, the Apostle Paul is pleading with Philemon to accept him back, not as a slave, but as a believer and a brother. Paul cared deeply for Onesimus because the young man had been a, a blessing to him. He ministered to him. He would encouraged Paul. He wanted Onesimus to stay there with him. In verses 12 and 14, he said, I'm sending him back to you I would have liked to have kept him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but rather would be voluntary. So he wanted, he wanted Philemon to, to, to make that decision on his own, but he wanted him to have all the facts, to make a good decision, to make a well-educated decision, to make a decision based on the gospel not according to the law of the land. A lot of times we don't know why God is working out things in our lives the way he works them out. I mean, we have disappointments. We, we get upset. We, we, we experience failures. When Onesimus took the money and he ran, split, left town, Philemon's probably upset. He's probably thinking, if I can get my hands on him. And also the church that, that was meeting in his home, that was being ministered to by, by him and, and his wife and, 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 and their son. What if, what if they had questions? What if it wasn't just Philemon that had money taken? What if it was, what if it was the offer? What if it was money that belonged to that church? What if it was money they had set aside? What about those questions? 
Why would God allow this to happen? And we have those questions today. And it's okay to ask those questions. But the heart of Paul's request in this letter is found in verses 15 to uh, verses 19. He says, perhaps the reason that Onesimus was separated for you from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Maybe Onesimus needed to see his true need, and that was the need for salvation. So when he took the money and he split and left town and ran away, maybe he began to feel conviction. Maybe he began to see as he entered into his travels from Colossae to Rome, how that other slaves were treated. And, and Philemon wasn't such a bad guy after all. Maybe he began to be convicted about the things that he had heard Paul preach when he was there. Maybe he began to remember things that he saw Philemon do in ministry to the people that came and, and worshipped at his home. Maybe the things that he had heard Philemon's son Archippus, as he ministered and preached the gospel. And he began to reflect on those things. He said, maybe he was separated from you for a little while, that you might have him back forever, not as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Paul said, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me to be your partner, to have fellowship with me, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you wrong or owes anything to you, charge it to me. Paul is essentially saying, I'm going to pay back what he stole. And any damages or reparations that are needed to be done after that, I'll take care of those too. And he affirmed that by saying, I am riding with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. So Paul said, Philemon, I, I, I led you to the Lord. I shared the gospel with you. I encouraged you. I discipled you. I want you to do for Onesimus what I have done for you. So throughout this, you kind of see the picture of Christ. Accepting our debt. You see Christ say, saying things like, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. Being reconciled. We've all had those moments where we, we've done something that we're not proud of and we say, God forgive me. My relationship with you is not what it used to be. I want to be closer to you. Reconciliation. Paul's asking Philemon to reconcile his relationship with Onesimus, not as a slave, but also as a brother. Paul challenges Philemon to receive Onesimus in the same way that he would receive Paul. A welcome. A reception. He reminds him of what has been done on his behalf. That he's experienced the grace and the mercy of God. Paul hopes that Philemon will look beyond Onesimus' bad choices, transgressions, and wrongdoing and reflect on the reality of forgiveness in Christ. The one who pardons our every wrong. The same way that we as church members, as believers in Christ ourselves, are to welcome those who come to Jesus in saving faith. No matter what their past is, no matter what they've done, no matter how they've treated us, we're to welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Though we might be skeptical at times, though it might be hard at times, what if you're the one who says, hey, I 
for you, because Christ has forgiven you, and because He's forgiven me, and now you have a new friend and a, and a new uh, relationship with someone that you would have never had otherwise, because you couldn't let go of something. the gospel in action. That's us putting Christ on display. Onesimus wanted to be free. As a slave, he ran from his master. You ever ran from God? Think you're running from him? But you wind up running right into him? What do you run into? Open. Reception. Forgiveness. Grace. Mercy. Love. All the things that you're running from are all the things that you need. Through salvation, this fugitive sinner finds grace, forgiveness, and freedom that is only found in Jesus Christ. His story is, is a picture of the distinction between law and grace. Roman law and, and the law of the Old Testament gave Philemon every right to punish Onesimus. But the grace through Jesus allowed both the master and the slave to fellowship together in love on an equal basis in the body of Christ in, in a believer's fellowship. Paul's offer of payment for all of Onesimus' debt is just a reflection of Christ's offer of salvation by paying for our sins. A debt that we could not pay. In verse 20 and 21, Paul says, Yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. And I have confidence in your obedience as I write to you since you know, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. So Paul knew Philemon in such a way that just based on his request to receive Onesimus back, that, that he would be received, that he would be welcomed, that he would be restored, and even more. He would be able to enjoy that freedom. He would be able to enjoy his salvation. He would be able to be welcomed into that fellowship. He would not be killed. He would not be branded as a fugitive. But rather he would be looked at as a brother in Christ. As a fellow believer. As one who had every right and, and all the authority uh, of of the, of the master. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost seeing that he lives to make intercession for us. Paul was making an intercession for Onesimus. And he knew that Philemon would grant that request. Isaiah said that the Messiah would be the one to make intercession for the transgressors. That's what Paul was doing. So you see, when we, when we live out Christ in our life, it's not just about being kind. It's not just about being nice. It's not just about not only sharing the gospel, but living it out. Being to others what Christ has been to us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul said, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who has died, and rather is risen again, and is even at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So Christ is not the one who condemns. Jesus said in, in John 3, 17, I have not come to condemn the world, but the world has been condemned already. We condemn ourselves by our unbelief and our rejection of Jesus Christ. And so if you're running from him this morning, Jesus is not condemning you. Jesus does not condemn you. Jesus will not condemn you. 
The law is what condemns you. Grace is what frees you. He's making intercession for us. He's our advocate. He's there on our behalf. It's almost as if when Paul interceded for Onesimus the same way that Jesus intercedes for us. The same things that he asked of Philemon, the same thing Jesus asked God on our behalf. I want you to receive them, Father. No longer as sinners, but those who have been washed and cleaned as brothers and sisters. Eternal sons and daughters of, of God. And I want you to treat them, Father, the way that you treat me. The blessings, the riches, the abundance. We're not just talking about material things here. Jesus says, and finally, if they owe you anything, God, put it on. I'll take care of them. I'll handle what they owe. Rest assured, he's already paid. He knew what we were up to. He's already paid. So all of our sins have been charged to Jesus because he said he would pay. All of our guilt is laid on him. All of our sins he carried on his shoulders and on his back as he hung on the cross. So Jesus said, if they owe you anything, put it on my account. I can pay. You got a Baptist hymn book in front of you. Open it up to hymn number 134. line. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We don't know a thing. Not one thing. Not one thing. And whether we have ran from him, or whether we're thinking about running from him, or whether we're in the middle of running from him, he's standing there, waiting for you, ready to receive you with those open arms. As Wally and Sheila come for our time of invitation, we're going to leave it on this page. And we're going to sing this song. My question for you this morning is, have you allowed him to pay it all for you? I'm asking.